they see the economy like a car. If it's going too slowly, if we're in a recession or a depression, you have to pump it up and step on the gas pedal. If it's going too fast, we have uh, too much inflation, and the economy is very tight, there's no unemployment, there's a ton of inflation, you have to hit the brakes, slow it down, to keep the economy going at the proper rate. And what they see is market failure. Only the economy keeps veering from going too slow and going too fast, and you need fiscal uh, taxing and spending policy, you need monetary policy to, to get the car on, on the right, uh, right speed. Or another analogy would be to keep the, the car on the right path is it's always veering off into inflation or into uh, unemployment, and uh, that, those are market failures, and we have to keep the economy on the straight and narrow by moving the steel. The Austrians see it very differently. For the Austrians, it's not a matter of too much spending or too little spending, it's a matter of spending on what? Suppose there are only two goods in the economy, guns and butter, we just pick two uh, products that are usually are used to illustrate things in economics, have the production possibilities curve. Any of you economics majors or know about production possibilities curve or forever using guns and butter? The Austrians don't see it as a matter of too much guns and butter or too little guns and butter, but rather the right amount of guns and butter com uh, compatible with what the consumers want. Now suppose the consumers want half guns and half butter. And what happens is that the government uh, penalizes guns and uh, subsidizes butter, and now we have more butter than we want, we're drowning in butter, and we hardly have any guns, call it hardware or whatever, cars, metal, things like that. Is the right answer to pump up both? No. The right answer is not to pump up both, but to cut down on the butter, of which we have too much, and to increase the guns or the hardware, so that we have the right proportions, the proportions that people want. I sometimes use an example uh, going on a diet. And if you go on a diet, we want less chocolate and more carrots. Whereas before, we had just the right amount of chocolate and carrots, and now we want more carrots and less chocolate. So it's a micro-theory of macroeconomics. Whereas those people, the Keynesians, have a macro-theory of macroeconomics, we Austrians have the theory that it's not a matter of too much or too little. It's not a matter of hitting the gas or hitting the brake. The gas and the brake won't do you any good if the problem is a misallocation. And it is a misallocation. Now I'm going to use the blackboard illustrate the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Uh, will this podium interfere with this? Uh, so I'll see if I write here. You're okay with that? Okay. So the way the Austrians see the business cycle is through the structure of production. Structure of production. And what is the structure of production? The structure of production is it's sort of like a triangle. And what you have here is consumption. What you have here are different stages of production. This might be retailing, this might be wholesaling, uh, this might be manufacturing, this might be manufacturing, this might be mining. In other words, this is heavy industry, and the way goods travel is this way through time. In other words, you start with heavy industry, or maybe you put a plant in for a coffee tree or something, which is going to take many years to come. And, and as the time goes, the, these things go through various stages of production. So at one time, this shirt was uh, it didn't have any buttons on it, so it might have been over here. And then when it got the buttons, it got closer to consumption, and then the retailer. Uh, is that comprehensible? And the thing gets bigger, because on this axis is money. And as, as you get closer to consumption, as the shirt gets buttons on it, uh, it gets more valuable. And, and you, you, sometimes you see them making cars, and, and the first thing you've got is all just this uh, chassis with no wheels, no seats, no steering wheel, no nothing. So as it goes through the assembly line, you can look at it as an assembly line, it gets more and more stuff on it, and then finally it pops out here as a, a, a car. The key element of Austrianism is what shape does this triangle have? Do we have a, uh, a long, thin triangle, like that? What do we have a short, fat triangle with very few stages? 
This is sort of the hand to mouth existence. You know, a uh, grizzly bear, the, its triangle is it goes like this into the uh, stream and it grabs a salmon and it, it eats it. So it's, uh, maybe there's just one stage, you know, the grabbing and eating, maybe two stages. The grabbing is the production and the eating is the consumption. So for a grizzly bear, uh, you're not going to have a very complex economy, a very, uh, very few stages. Whereas for our modern economy, there are many, many stages. We think in terms not of uh, one hour, remember this is time on this axis, but we think in terms of 20, 30, 50, 100 years. I mean, if you uh, put a redwood seed in the ground now, you, you're thinking uh, 100 years, you'll get a tree. Uh, coffee trees take a long time. Uh, it takes years if you uh, want to uh, hunt for oil or a mine, a copper mine. You first you have to find it, then you have to uh, figure out what to do, and you have to put roads in there to get the copper out, or you get it out with a helicopter. I mean, it's going to take years before the copper gets put in a, in a pipe or something like that. So our uh, time horizon is very long. The people here have a very short time horizon. Let me say something for which Hans Hoppe almost got fired from UNLV. And what he said is that gays have a shorter time horizon than straights. Why? Because they're less likely to have children. And therefore, their time horizon is more likely to be their own lives. Whereas uh, straights are, uh, disproportionately have more children. And therefore, their time horizon is not just their own lives, but the lives of their children, their grandchildren, great-grandchildren. So they have a greater time horizon. They're more like this and less like that. They almost got fired because they, they uh, said, well, he's an anti homophobe or anti-gay uh, sexist or whatever it was, but he was just trying to use an example and make it come alive to his students, and, and you know, I didn't think he did anything wrong. I thought it was a very reasonable way to il illustrate time preference or interest rates, because the interest rate is that angle. That's what the interest rate is. Here, the interest rate is very low, this is a low angle. Here, the interest rate is very high, because the interest rate is that angle, it's very high. So people here are very impatient. Let me give you another example, and people will probably accuse me of being anti-young people, uh, ageist. You ask a little kid about five years old, you want one candy corn now or 20 tomorrow? He's got no concept of tomorrow, or very little concept of, give me now. Whereas you ask one of us, you know, do you want one chocolate bar now or one candy bar uh, now or 20 of them tomorrow or an hour from now? And we're likely to say, you know, I'm not that impatient. I mean, I'd like it now. There is time preference for the present, but, you know, I can wait a little bit, especially if the reward is so big. So in an economy uh, orchestrated with little kids, it's going to be, they're going to be very impatient and they're going to have now, now, now. It's a now, now, now economy. Whereas for adults, you know, we're, we're willing to save. I mean, if you're a little kid, you're not going to save. You're going to spend. You get your allowance, you spend it. Whereas if you're going to save, then you're more like this, and now you can support more investment. Because here is consumption, and here is all sorts of investment. So notice that the Austrian theory is not a theory of how much. It's a theory of where. Are we putting it in the right places? OK, so now let me say that let's suppose that this is the proper triangle, okay, that this is the triangle that is compatible with the marginal saving investment, the, uh, the saving consumption ratio of the people. This is the right triangle. And what happens when the government increases the money supply, here we have the supply of money, demand for money, and the amount of money, and straightforward mainstream way of looking at it. And the government increases the supply of money to S prime. What does it do to the interest rate? It lowers the interest rate. No uh, genius remark here. I mean, it's very straightforward. It lowers the interest rate. Namely, it makes this triangle look flatter than it really is. Remember, we, we, we want, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, chocolate and carrots in, in a certain ratio, and all of a sudden we're getting more chocolate and less carrots, and we want this amount, and we keep trying to get back to what we want. 
The point of the Austrian business cycle theory is that this triangle is unsustainable. All of this stuff is excessive, excessive investment. More investment than is called for by the time preference rates, namely what determines interest rates, by the impatience of the people. So you have what's called unsustainable investments that are pushed or subsidized or the entrepreneurs are now led by Adam Smith's invisible hand to make profits, and they think that the rate of interest is lower than it, it really is. Or, or rather, the interest rate is lower than what it should be. This is what it is. This is what it ought to be. Ought not in the ethical sense, but in the sense of ought to be if it's going to be compatible with people's time preferences for the present and the future. So what the government does is it keeps pushing resources into places where it never should have been, Think houses and cars, which are long-term kinds of things. It's not just how long it takes to build it, it's also how long it lasts. And a house might take years to build if you think of how long it took to get the copper and how long it took to get the bricks and how long it took to get the wires. And then the bloody thing is gonna last. I mean, this building here must be 100, 200 years old. I mean, it's very well constructed. Most houses don't last that long, but you know, you're not gonna get a house that lasts for six months. A house will last for 50, 100, 150 years, 200 years. So it's a very long-term investment, and we had too many of them because the government was pushing us in that direction. That's the Austrian analysis of this sort of thing. And the uh, solution to the problem is to get rid of these unwise investments. Instead, what the, and not just Obama, but they're all Keynesians. I mean, I mean uh, Nixon was a Keynesian, it's Republicans, they're all Keynesians. What they're trying to do is to support this. They're trying to keep housing prices up. Got too many houses. Got to uh, allow the price to fall so that uh, entrepreneurs are no longer uh, incentivized to keep producing more houses that we don't want, and rather they're more incentivized to produce stuff that we do want. OK, so that's an introduction to Ron Call's two motivating forces. Now,